clean robotics came out of the frustration of recycling. Our, our customers are generally high traffic public places. So airports, convention centers, stadiums, hospitals, places where, where uh, people are generally the worst at recycling. Hey everyone, welcome to another Hatchpad Insight. I'm Tim Winkler, founder of Hatch IT, creator of Hatchpad. Today we're chatting with Tanner Cook, the Vice President of Engineering at Clean Robotics, an AI and robotics startup headquartered in Pittsburgh. Thanks for hanging with us at the Hatchpad. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Glad to be here. Why don't we go ahead and kick it off with a quick minute overview on your background and then we'll jump into some additional questions. Sure. Again, I'm Tanner Cook. I'm the VP of Engineering and co-founder at Clean Robotics. We make smart trash cans and smart waste systems. My background is in a little bit of everything. I was a nuclear engineer for a number of years at a nuclear fusion startup. I previously had my own nanotech startup that we had sold. And uh, now I'm here doing artificial intelligence and robotics. Cool. Interesting background, interesting profile. And coming into an early stage startup here as the VP of engineering, were there any other technical folks prior to you joining or were the, the founding team pretty technical as well? Yeah, we had some core members that early on that had to drop out due to a variety of reasons, but we had a, a professor of robotics from Carnegie Mellon University, who is one of the founding members, as well as some pretty executive level technology uh, experts at the very beginning of our, our foundation. Again, they had to drop out pretty early due to personal reasons and left me uh, with the reins for, for most everything. Um, well, why don't we dive into a little bit about Clean Robotics and, and who they are as a company? Maybe um, just give us the, the, the story on how the, the company evolved. Sure, sure. Clean Robotics came out of uh, the frustration of recycling. So everyone has approached a recycling and trash can and stood there with their item and thought about where this item should go. And then you sit there for about three seconds and then you wind up guessing. So we saw an issue around that whole interaction with the, the trash cans and the fact that people sometimes confuse, sometimes would guess or just wouldn't even know, frankly, where their items of waste should go. And we found that created so many issues uh, down the line in the recycling chain and the whole recycling and waste industry. We really wanted to pinpoint that, that beginning interaction to help solve a slew of other issues. Most people think that someone else will figure out whether or not that item is recyclable and a robot will sort it out down the line. That's sometimes true. Most of the time, if you guess wrong, that means that a lot of other, what would be highly recyclable material just goes straight to the landfill and will never be recovered and reused. And, and so we're, what we've developed is uh, a smart trash can that'll take that decision out of your hands and automatically separate recyclables away from landfill waste, away from compostables in order to achieve the highest quality and quantity of recyclable goods that we possibly can and to really keep all of those high quality commodities in a, in a circular economy. Yeah, it's crazy how uh, a lot of those stats on recycling are, are never really um, publicized. I think a lot of folks think the system's just working. We, we, we got the our blue bins here. People just throw their stuff right. in. But I don't think people really see the, the behind the scenes of a landfill and really how much of a cluster it can become if it's not sorted appropriately on the front lines by consumers. Certainly. Some of the sad numbers that are there. Only about 6% of plastic bottles actually wind up being recycled in the United States, hmm. uh, which is it's atrociously low. Of the recyclable material in the United States, of, of the things that could be recycled, slightly less than 20% actually do get recycled, hmm. which is a pretty pretty bad number. Again, we can certainly do better. So it's the threshold for recycling is, is the bar is very low. And uh, so there's a, a lot of room to improve it. And, and again, it's not always people's faults because recycling changes so heavily depending on where you're at, even the time of year, 
whether the local rules change just on the go. So something as simple as a plastic bottle but can become super complex, whether or not it's colored plastic bottle, how much liquid is left in it, whether it's crushed, whether the cap is on it does matter to the recyclability of an object. And then the worst of all is it can change just 20 miles down the road, all those little tiny rules around it. So it's, it, can, it, it certainly is not an easy task. Yeah, I, I love the mission-driven feel behind what the company is doing. It seems when whenever you're growing a, a company like this at a small stage, and it's a, called a very mission-driven organization, it's super important to get folks on board that also are passionate or, or care about what, you know, what's being done. Do you find that when you're building out your team, and, and just to, to preface, I guess, what's the current size of the company? Uh, We're small. So there's about five of us, six of us full time. And then we've got uh, quite a few contractors just in our orbit, just because of the, due to the uh, kind of the sophistication of the product. Sure. So like when you're looking at growing uh, new team members internally, is it part of your hiring philosophy to, to, you know, hope that they're, you know, on board with this mission, that they're passionate about what's being done here versus just looking to fill a, a job position? So I think it is important for all of our new hires to have a a passion for at least social causes or the environment in general. Some people that we have hired do are are extremely just excited about the recycling aspect in general, and they understand that it's such a large problem universally. So that's, uh, we do look to hire those kinds of people, uh, especially passion helps drive better products and and, and create better companies and Mm -hmm. and better environments within working relationships within companies. So we certainly do look for that. We feel that we definitely draw a, a certain type of personality to our company, just again, due to the what we call the triple bottom line nature of it, the the profit motive, the social motive, and then the environmental motive yeah. uh, behind our company. Neat. I'd say we'll, we'll jump in a little bit more about what those kind of attributes look like. But before that, let's talk a little bit deeper on the tech behind your core product here, TrashBot. It seems like a really fascinating combination of hardware, software. Can you dive into what that tech looks like? And then uh, we can maybe... Uh, probe a little bit deeper on some of those areas? Certainly. So at face value, we're, we're putting a computer into a trash can and the possibilities with that really branch out from there. Primarily the reason that, the, that we have the system in there is to be able to recognize items of waste using a complex computer vision algorithm that we've written and then to, to sort it according to the, the local rules. And, and building that is, has actually taken a number of years and uh, has won us some, some awards and gotten us pretty far, especially in the, if you're aware of it, the AI X Prize. So it's a $5 million prize. We're one of the, the finalists from the 1,000 initial teams. We're one of the, the 10 finalists for that. I'm rather proud of our accomplishments there with our, our artificial intelligence and the impact of it. Uh, and beyond that, there's the relationship with a robotic system that uses something like that. There's, of course, the software that drives and makes many of the decisions. There's the electrical and the electromechanical aspects, uh, the robotics, conventional robotic stuff, the, the movement, the detection, the upkeep, the, all of that stuff internally of all the systems. And then there's the hardware stuff as well. It, it is still fundamentally a trash can. So all those three things have to interface with each other in order to create a product that provides the value uh, of being good at recycling and being able to tell people how they can be better at recycling. It is, a, again, a complex system and, and people don't treat trash cans very nicely either. So it's how do you get those into a system where uh, people don't treat it very nicely, where your artificial intelligence has to recognize nearly anything since anything can be garbage and then have that do a a substantially better job than people. And that's the the fundamentals of of what we do on the technology side is is really bring all those aspects together in a way that that works and works well. Yeah, it's fascinating to to think about these trash cans out and 
out in the real world being used in production. They're probably not uh, cheap to, to manufacture, to have these created. So to trust that folks aren't going to dam- damage them. I think to an example, maybe of the, the ride or the bird scooters in a sense, there's a sense of trust. Are folks going to take care of these or how, how many, how many of these are in production today and what are your plans in terms of- So we're actually that? just making another batch of 20 right now. The number that are currently out in the wild I think is around 20. I think we were a little over that, but we're accelerating a lot of our manufacturing and stuff as we speak. And you mentioned the cost earlier, which is a funny thing. And, and what's nice about what we've made is it costs just about as much as normal trash cans do, which is another kind of point of engineering pride amongst ourselves that we've managed to, to utilize low cost sensors and, and systems in order to to drive down the price. And the, most of the cost is just in the, the metal shell, like you'd see with uh, most any other trash can, yeah. which is pretty pretty incredible that we're able to do that. And we, we hope to have hundreds to a thousand deployed by the end of 2021 is what it's looking like. And who's like uh, the, the primary, call it a customer, but organization, who's coming out and expressing interest in having owning these or having right. these on their facilities? So it's our, our customers are generally high traffic public places. So airports, convention centers, stadiums, hospitals, places where, where people are generally the worst at, at recycling. They're either in a rush, they just don't know the local rules. And uh, a lot of these places have been struggling for, for decades to, to either create a recycling program or improve upon their existing one. Getting back to the tech side of things. So yeah, the hardware piece obviously tied into the the trash bot. It, it's talking to a piece of software with some sort of possibly a dashboard. Like, can you paint the picture of like how this is being received, the data points and where they're going and how that looks to say be a, a user or business that's that's analyzing the the what's happening? Sure, sure. So we just got a Kind of a semi-basic online dashboard that just disseminates a lot of the information that we gather. And a lot of these places, they just want to know the general items. They want to know how much it weighs, you know, when the bins are being taken out, how empty or full they are at any given moment. And we just have that all displayed on an online dashboard for each of our customers and relatively simple. Beyond that, we do some higher level data analytics where we can deep dive in and then show general trends as well as areas of improvement. It's a separate data product that we have and for the, the benefit of the environmental teams and the, the strategy teams there at, at the facilities that we work with. But overall, that, that system is, it's no Facebook where it's got every little widget that you could imagine, but it's more of a, a, a data kind of display dashboard, mm-hmm. if anything. Uh, yeah. So there's a, so there's an AI aspect to this. And it also seems that there's some growth that's happening on your all's end to the, to the point where you're looking to bring in some pretty key individuals to head up the software development side of things. Can you give some insight into what, what kind of role you're anticipating so that folks that are coming to apply or interested in exploring more about clean robotics could expect uh, in this type of position? Certainly, as we spoke about a little bit earlier, the software, especially with the robotic system like this data system, it encompasses quite quite a large kind of scope, especially in the IoT realm. So while it's impossible to nearly impossible to find someone who who knows about every single one of those things and, and at professional level, what we're really looking for is someone who has an understanding at least at a basic level of each of the aspects that we're, we're involved with and uh, is able to make and drive decisions around those different software aspects of what we're doing. So, of course, there's the data aspect, the database storage aspect, there's the IoT, there's the artificial intelligence, there's uh, somewhat of the firmware. I think we handle that in, in the engineering, the robotics side a little bit more. But being able to oversee all of those, kind of plan the architecture of the general system and then execute, whether it be through contractors or with more additional hires and be able to manage those general project 
projects that are going on. Mm -hmm. The type of person that we're looking for is uh, probably has a, a decent amount of experience, certainly understands what a startup uh, is and is about the risks that are involved with a, a startup and joining a startup. You don't have the job security that you do with you know, working at Google or Facebook nearly as much, but there's certainly the upsides as well. The ability to be a part of something where you're a major you're the major engine, I should say, of the system, right? Where you're making decisions that will have direct and immediate impacts on uh, understanding that and, and then being able to, to be agile on your feet with making decisions around all the different systems and, uh, and being able to fix things when they go wrong in a, in a decently timely manner without panicking, I yeah. should say, is also important. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think this is a very appealing role for somebody to come in as the the go-to person on the software side of things. Would this be something that you would look at as some kind of greenfield development where they're able to make some specific architectural decisions on the tech that they feel would plug and play best with the hardware side of things? Certainly. So there's, there's already some that are semi-locked in decisions just because uh, firmware plays has to play in a certain way with the, the existing hardware and other systems. But there is a lot of wiggle room for growth and development. And to date, the architecture that we have works, but I certainly think it could be better, especially considering our growth outlook in the future. And I'm certainly not the best person for that job. My background is not in uh, uh, software architecture. And that's why we're looking for someone to really uh, work well with our existing engineering team to, to lead the decisions and major decisions there. Yeah. And in such a small organization, it seems like the team's pretty distributed. They're not all sitting in a, in a co-working space or an office space right now. Everybody's working autonomously. How do you all stay on task with one another? How do you collaborate? What, what, is, what are some of the hacks that you all have seen has worked really well for your team when, it's, when it comes right. to you know, collaboration? I think uh, primarily it's, uh, there's two things. One, I think the type of personalities that we look to hire are generally heavy self-starters and tend to look for problems and solve them without having to ask as much permission or, or going back and forth with everyone and we also have a daily meeting where we each kind of plan out our days with each other to make sure that everything kind of just gels right. It's generally a 15, 20 minute meeting and, and then just various meetings throughout the day that we'll all jump on and just ask questions of each other and different third party members. But it's pretty, the general culture is, is fairly hands off. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows what the distinct overall goals are. They know what the immediate fires that we need to put out are. And then everyone just goes from there in general. And it seems to work pretty well. And everyone seems to, to, to get along pretty well with that method. What's nice is we do have the, the product aspect of what we're doing. It's, there's something different and special about being able to work on a, a product that will physically be out there and doing something mm. that's totally different than in the software for the 747. Mm. It's cool, but being able to walk up to a trash can that you helped write the software for and throwing an item away in it and seeing other people do the same is pretty cool. And seeing people get excited about it is, is something exciting, right? And especially at such a fundamental level, you'd be like, I helped invent that. And that's sure. so much fun. Thank <laughs> you.